Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the open door. Jim Hannock and Matthew Bartko here with our friends John Breen, Mario Ramos y Reyes, Skylar Kovach, chair of the National Committee of the Party, and a new and very welcome guest, Christy Al of the uh, Maryland Solidarity Party. We'll begin with a prayer, the Veni Sancte Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you will renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same spirit, help us to relish what is good and right, and always rejoice in your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll ask Matthew once again, our stalwart to be our guide as we return to the UN Declaration on Human Rights. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Before we dive right into that, let's give our uh, newest guest, Christy, a chance to uh, introduce herself and uh, let our uh, listeners get to know this uh, new panelist. Hi, I'm Christy. Um, I'm the interim chairwoman of the American Solidarity Party of Maryland. I'm currently finishing my undergrad in um, early childhood education, and yeah, it's me. <laughs> and, and Christy, I understand that uh, they're asleep, but you actually have another guest with you that may wake up at some point during the show. Yes, I have Andrew. I'm babysitting. <laughs> and I also have Elvis and Rosie, who are also asleep. They're dogs, so... <laughs> nice. Hopefully, nice. I will be the only one you hear. But fair warning. So, this week we're in Article Twenty Two of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the article reads: Everyone, as a member of society, has the right to social security, and is entitled to the realization through national effort and international cooperation and in accordance with organization and resources of each state of the economic, social, and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and for the free development of his personality. I... I, you know, in just about every uh, political forum I can think of, this uh, article is enough to start fights. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, just get a basic uh, where each of our panelists are coming from and ask them to define uh, Social Security and to uh, give everyone a fair chance to formulate their thoughts. We'll uh, ask Jim to go first so they have plenty of time. I, I got what you're getting at there. <laughs> <laughs> you rascal. When I see Social Security, I, I first think of Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, I guess I secondly think of how Social Security, as he understood it, was meant to be uh, a help. But by, by no means what we might call a, a complete safety net. And doubtless... Uh, people coming from other backgrounds and people at the United Nations at that time uh, had a a different understanding of Social Security. Uh, I think a good beginning point would be to say that there is a, a basic commitment that people 
not fall off the boat uh, and that people not be at the very edge of, of the boat, the, the ship that we're all on, but rather that they feel that they do have a place in the social and economic structure of their respective states. Thanks, Jim. And I think it's uh, important that, you know, at least in this country, we do bring that up. I think Roosevelt um, signed the uh, social security laws that we uh, started with in 1935, whereas the uh, UN declaration uh, didn't come out until I believe it was uh, 1948. So uh, a little over a decade later. Uh, Mario, would you go ahead and give us uh, your understanding of the definition of uh, Social Security? Well, I think it's uh, very interesting, um, these articles, uh, this article. But um, I look at the, the article in the context of the 1930s and early 1940s. And we need to remember then that uh, Pius XI um, criticized at that point uh, individualism. But at the same time, he emphasized the need for have for uh, um, then was a, a new way of looking at things, new philosophy of personalism. And, and there is another word which was being used in the 1930s. I'm talking about the you know, social teaching, the, the tradition then, which was solidarism, which has to do in some ways with the common good. And the reason why this uh, term began to be use was because in 1929, the crash of Wall Street affected not only the United States and the industrialized then uh, uh, countries, but also the developing countries. In Latin America was very crucial. So many movements began to propose certain ways by which workers could survive in um, all age uh, this um, financial crisis. And I see um, Roosevelt as a champion in that sense when he signed up the Social Security Act uh, to help in that um, in, in, in this uh, to achieve this goal. So somehow help people um, regardless their age or ability to work, uh, some kind of uh, guarantee of the means necessary uh, for. Uh, basic needs and, and, and basic needs and services. This is I want to begin this reflection. Thanks, Mario. I do appreciate it. And uh, John, can you go ahead and give us your understanding of the definition of Social Security? Well, as it stands right now, Social Security is an organization that takes up a good chunk of my paycheck into a fund which I'm not even sure will be there when I come of age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry for being persnickety about Very it, but that's, yeah. just, that's just kind of a, a thought that I have right now. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure that when the when it was institutionalized, when it first came out, that, that there were good intentions. I don't doubt that, but uh, I was I'm a little bit of uh, suspicious of of the quote unquote relief that uh, President Roosevelt brought during his presidency because this uh, Social Security, amongst all the other bills that he passed and brought into law and whatnot, um, they were ultimately only made finalized or materialized uh, by a war. So he brought all these good, you know, all these good sounding ideas, but it took a war to, to finalize it, to bring it about. So, yeah, that's kind of my, my thoughts on the matter. It started out as a good intention, but I think since then it's been it's been over institutionalized and it's turned into I think there's a lot of mismanagement going on with it and frankly I'm questioning whether it's really needed at this point point. and uh, Christy what are your thoughts sure so when I first hear the word social security I always think of you know our older population and I think people are kind of weary of talking about Social Security in younger populations. I think that it's kind of a little, you know, comfort bubble, like the elder care is very partisan. 
And then when you start talking about it for other populations, you get into questions of should we be giving people social security if they're younger? To what extent? And that's when it gets a little murky. Thanks. And uh, Skylar, what does social security mean to uh, your understanding within this uh, context of the article? Right. Yeah. So, so uh, Christy makes a good point that in the U.S., it's uh, you know we mainly think of it as for the elderly, but uh, you know there are social security programs for the disabled as well, which I particularly you know thought about as a disabled person. And uh, so, in this article, you know, it says that you know we're supposed to provide these economic resources to people who are struggling depending on the the resources of the state and uh and then also with some international cooperation which is kind of unspecified in, in this context uh but i think john is also right that there's a lot of mismanagement in the social security uh program so does that mean that we don't have the resources to provide more social security or even keep what we have now, or is it just that we're not allocating the resources in the correct way and should be figuring out some, some uh, different ways to, to restructure things entirely. Uh, excellent point. Um, something I just wanted to bring up is uh, in the last sentence of the article, it refers to the social or to the economic social and cultural rights indispensable for his dignity and the free development of his personality. So I know that in a lot of our conversation about uh, social security, we, we talk primarily about economics, but it, it, it seems that this article puts equal weight on the economics and also the social and cultural uh, right. rights. His cultural uh, rights is pretty vague in this context, and it, it probably does cause even more fights than the economic issues, uh, you know, at, at least these days, I, I think, you know, in, in some of our uh, circles. Possibly. Uh, and then I also wanted to hone in on this word, uh, indispensable for his dignity. And, and so, um, you know, Scott, I'll give you the first up. What, 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 what kind of things are we talking about when we're talking about as the country or as the state is able to provide that would be indispensable for dignity and free development of personality? Right. Well, that's, yeah, I think a lot of our problem, a lot of the problem with the, uh, you know, the whole life political message that I think we all have sympathies for is, is that, yes, we, you know, human dignity is, is great but we can't even really agree on what specifically that means. So, uh, yeah. is it more of a uh, personal feeling of being provided for? Well, some people just feel, you know, an overwhelming guilt that they're on a government program anyway. Uh, is it that uh, they feel like they're doing some sort of useful work, even if they're not being paid by an employer, uh, uh, that that might be helpful. So, like, even if you are disabled or elderly or you know whatever is going on, it would be ideal maybe if if uh, there was some way of uh, feeling uh, like you're contributing to society. So, like, maybe it would be good if Social Security came with. Uh, it, especially for the disabled, came with some sort of counseling. Like the State Department of Rehab, for example, which I'm a part of, comes with uh, career with, with counseling, uh, you know, career counseling, things like that. Uh, you know, training for orientation and mobility, for example, for myself as a blind person, and all of that is is imperfect. But it's the State Department of Rehab is far better than the Social Security system federally or, you know, dealing with integration in the community. So it would be good if there was more like that. And as for the free development of personality, that's where things get even more controversial because, well, like, what, what if the free development of what you want as a personality is, is either immoral or should not really be 
provided by the government. Like, like you can only go so far with that. But you know, maybe it's maybe the right balance is figuring out ways that you can contribute to the community uh, as a person who who may be receiving resources. Thank you, thank you. I do appreciate that. Uh, look, I, I think it's important to uh, remember that the uh, declaration isn't just written for a U.S. audience. And so I think uh, right. both our Social Security program and, you know, the Office for Students with Disabilities that was on my college campus and, uh, you know, our uh, social welfare programs, I, I think all of those would fall under this umbrella of uh, social security beyond just the particular program in the United States that's called uh, social security. Right. And it'll be interesting to look at programs in other countries, whether more, you know, in Euro the European social democracies or in even some of the, the African or Asian countries and, and try to figure out if they do have more of that community integration piece. So, so, Christy, let me ask you, what, what does that last sentence mean to you as, as far as being indispensable for dignity and for the free development of personality? Sure. So I think it's all about looking at the individual and not painting everyone with the same brush. Like, I'm going to create a social program for, let's say, students with disabilities. And I think every student with this particular disability needs this, this, and that. I think this is saying, Article 22, rather, is saying that we need to create a more holistic program that looks at the whole person and looks at the whole individual and doesn't just kind of throw things out there at them that might be helpful and might be not. And we need to look at specific populations and their needs. Thank you. Um, John, let me ask you, um, given the what we're talking about with, with this um, universal declaration and it's called to uh, have social security that is indispensable for dignity and the free development of personality. How do you think the U S does it that not just with our program that's called social security, but as, as a society, how do we do at guaranteeing security for dignity and for the development of personality? Um, to be completely honest, I, I'm not. In, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not. Uh, I don't know too much of what goes on as far as social security goes. Um, I just think that you know, as as far as the institution, uh, that for something for as broad, broad as it's, as it's calling, and the amount and the broad uh, cultural spectrum that we have here, this is this is something that can't be simply dealt at the federal level. And right, right. And I'm, not asking, I'm not asking just at the federal level. I'm saying we as a society, as a, as a multi-layered society, how do you feel like American culture does with this kind of uh, guarantees, with, with providing each individual within our society, within our culture, dignity and development of personality? I think the culture is under attack as far as, as dignity goes. Uh, dignity is going under different definitions as we speak and uh one of them is is the uh, subject of diversity which i think this article in the second half of it is uh is addressing is that is that i think it's making a blagan statement towards cultural diversity but it it doesn't mention uh doesn't really mention legitimate diversity so i'm i'm not i'm not entirely sure to be quite honest Thanks, John. Uh, Mario, what, what are your thoughts on the various points that have been discussed so far? Um, uh, I believe we need to make a distinction in order to understand uh, uh, better, I think, our discussion, which is the distinction between principles and public policy. And uh, that article, I think, set out the principle. And principles are broad enough in order to cover many subjects. In this case, how to protect people in old age or in certain circumstances, um, their uh, livelihood. I think that was the point because, again, the context is, in, is important. 
when you reach to a certain point, you don't have the strength to continue working, and you expect uh, society help you somehow in order to continue your, your life. Now, how then we achieve that through certain public policies? That is up to every, every state. Now, looking from the perspective of an immigrant, I think you are too pessimistic about this. Because you were raised in a country where there's no social security, no welfare state. You are on your own when you are getting into a certain age. The only people in whom you can trust are your children. That is why some uh, many a developing country has many children. That's your social security. Now, in the United States, I think there are certain institutions, not only from the federal government who give you certain amount of money, perhaps it's not enough, um, it's going to get um, uh, bankrupt, whatever the, the forecast that we make about this is. But also, we may have, and we do have, I think, certain mediating institution which may help people in this um, stage of life. In other words, there are people who have some free access to certain um, institution in order to somehow uh, live as best as they can the uh, older age. Compared to other uh, uh, countries, even developing countries, I think is not quite, I'm not quite pessimistic about it. It's not perfect. The public policy and how to fund them may be revised. There is a lot of uh, corruption, perhaps. I, I agree with that. But I think overall, I don't see a big picture. In other words, I think it's, it can be fixed. And another point I want to, and I am not sure that I agree with the claim that, well, we don't have a definition of human dignity. Um, perhaps that is precisely the claim of certain people who that I, it, come from the enlightenment view that this is just, uh, I don't know, uh, Christian prejudice. But if we think as dignity, as the human being are, sh should be respected unconditionally, that human beings are not tool of anything else, that human beings are not those beings should, that should be discarded like the, uh, uh, Pope Francis says, I think we may agree, or most people uh, would agree with this view. In other words, we are a being which uh, our dignity is such a high caliber that we must be respected. And I think most people would agree with that. Um, and I think we need to start um, making those distinctions in order to understand um, the whole uh, article, I think. Thank you, Mario. Uh, Jim, I want to give you a chance to uh, weigh in with your thoughts and if you have any questions for our panelists. Yes, uh, I'm thankful for, for John Breen's raising some hard questions, and I'm certainly thankful for Mario's optimism and hope and uh, his making comparisons between uh, different uh, political configurations and what they've offered in the past. Uh, in light of that, I'd like to uh, emphasize that the article, as we've uh, read it, calls for national effort and international cooperation and international cooperation in accordance with the organization and resources of each state. Now, there's a passage in Jacques Maritain's uh, classic work, Man and the State, that I think addresses uh, how broad Social Security should be understood, how broadly understood and also the international dimension. And bear with me when I read this. It's, it's just a paragraph or so. And it's written in the middle 50s. Maritan says, Given the human condition, 
the most significant synonym of living together is suffering together. When men form a political society, and here I think he's being very realistic, they do not want to share in common suffering out of love for each other. They want to accept common suffering out of love for the common task and the common good. The will to achieve a worldwide common task must therefore be strong enough to entail a will to share in certain common sufferings made inevitable by that task and by the common good of a worldwide suffering. Sorry, worldwide society. What sufferings indeed? Sufferings due to solidarity. And Maritain goes on to say that if we're really going to exercise solidarity in pursuit of a common task to promote human development and human security, what we have to do is to to strive to overcome gross inequalities (coughs) in wealth and gross inequality in the, the distribution of social resources. And that's very much a challenge. And uh, that's what I think the Solidarity Party can can help people to think about. Thanks, Jim. Uh, on to that, since we have uh, two party officers with us this morning, uh, let's start with Christy and ask, uh, what does the Solidarity Platform have to offer by way of commentary on or policy suggestions for Social Security? Sure. So I've been kind of in my head during your conversation thinking about the adage, think locally, act globally. And I think the Solidarity Party does a really good job of that. We look at how our actions affect the global world around us, and we advocate for policies that really do help the global world, but instituted in our own communities, starting at the grassroots level. Thanks. Uh, Skylar, what's your uh, read on that? How how do you think the uh, platform of the American Solidarity Party speaks to uh, social security, not not just the particular agency of the U.S. government, but but the broader sense that this article is talking about? Right. Yeah, I was just going to try to to, uh, look up maybe some specific planks in the platform, but that would take a minute. Uh, But there's certainly lots of... uh, uh, specific ideas for uh, the type of social safety net we should have uh, in the U.S., as well as uh, calls to uh, you know contribute to the global efforts uh, you know through our uh, international organizations and uh, you know various efforts to. Uh, you know, bring humanitarian aid. Uh, also, uh, you know, the generous policy on asylum for refugees uh, would, would be another specific point. And uh, so, yeah, Christy is right that the the uh, think uh, you know the, the balance between the local and the global is is really important and definitely difficult to achieve. I think uh, one of the great struggles of the party is. Uh, how to communicate ways that we can achieve that. You know, hopefully we'll be running candidates soon who will be able to to articulate that uh, in a strong way. Because I think when you get down to specific proposals, uh, you often get people who will, uh, you know, be critical of them because they see ways in which they might be counterproductive or, or they, they don't work. And I, I think part of what's going on is that we know so much about, uh, you know, how certain proposals like, you know, international cooperation can go wrong, that we mistrust, that, that there's many people, even in the Solidarity Party, who mistrust a lot of the entire process. So it's something to, to always keep understanding those concerns, but also bringing up solutions. Thank you. I, I do note that uh, in here, 
it, it talks about the the resources of the state in particular, and then this is a document that is particularly geared toward um, governments. You know, you know the the United Nations is a, is a organization of states. So it's not necessarily uh, writing in regard to churches or uh, voluntary membership organizations. But as as I'm reading this, uh, especially in regard to full development of personality, I I mean, we're going to get on to Article 23, which is going to be much more about work. And then Article 24 is about having a a rest. Uh, 25 is about standards of living and 26 is about education. 27 goes on to culture and uh, art. Uh, I mean, it, it just, you know, the, the next several articles are going to talk about the ways that this article is played out with those guarantees. But uh, one area that I think we touched on um, earlier, and, and per- perhaps uh, this would be covered under uh, one of the future articles that's going to talk about, you know, the right yeah. to uh, join unions. But, uh, You know, as I'm thinking about, uh, in particular, uh, cultural and social rights, I mean, is there a right to see ballet? Is there a right to hear music? Is there a right to education? Is there a right to be able to walk alone in a forest without seeing another human being? Uh, You know, what are... You know, that's kind of what my uh, first round of question or my second round of question I was getting at is what what are these uh, indispensable requirements for dignity and for the free development of personality? And and so I guess I'll just go back to uh, John and give you a chance to uh, respond either to Mario or to any other stuff that's come up or ask any questions that you have of any of the panelists. Well, I guess a thought that I've been having, uh, I, I think that Social Security has been seen as almost, uh, I think Social Security has become more of like a minimalist uh, mode of thought, whereas when it was first started, it was supposed to be considered as something supplemental. But as we see with different cases, with different applications for Social Security, it's become a primary uh, a primary need. So one question that I would probably want to pose is, it, does this article, uh, would it pertain, do you think that it, it points out to a possible uh, minimalist mentality with the use of Social Security or not? Uh, let's go around and ask. Uh, Christy, what do you think? Sure. So I think that Social Security should give you probably the, sorry, (laughs) collecting my thoughts, Um, the base minimum to survive. I think it's our responsibility to make sure all of our citizens survive, but how are we kind of helping them to thrive, if that makes sense? Hmm. We should be helping them to be self-sustaining. So is it fair to say that what you're saying is that it's minimalist as far as the minimum it should do is keep essentially dying in the streets, you know, keep, keep people alive at subsistence level? I think it should help give them a leg up, kind of to do whatever they can do to thrive, kind of to give them a little push, if that makes sense. Um. Thanks. Well, yeah, so one of the the debates here might be uh, should there be uh, social security for the working poor? So could it, you know, would you then have a system where the uh, uh, either there's a basic minimum for people who who are not working at all uh, whether they can't find a job or whether there's, uh, you know, a reason of disability why they're not working, but then the the working poor should be given some resources as well to do even better. I think that's one of the big debates that that uh, has to come up. And then as as far as the uh, uh, more cultural rights, that's 
I mean, nobody could have imagined that there would be so much uh, entertainment and all that 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 could be gotten for free with the internet. Uh, right. And so that uh, complicates things. I, I think there are. It, it would be great to be able to to see the. Uh, you know, to live in a society that that uplifts people culturally and and uh, you know exposes people to all of the best of what we have. You know, whether that's uh, you know all of Matthew's examples, I think are are very good. But I, I think it's hard to get that agreement of what specifically those cultural rights should be. Uh, and, and so I think that probably does need to be done more through. Uh, you know, just build building communities at the local level and and bringing people out into that in, into those opportunities through the communities. Because when I'm posing this my, my, question here, sorry. Go ahead, Mario. Uh, yes, um, uh, everyone I think agree that a, a good society uh, ought to provide a safety net for, let's say, the less fortunate citizen. Everyone agree on that. But, I, well, think, but uh, I think this principle must also raise the question, or we should be also uh, ask ourselves how us, members of the Solidarity Party, can contribute for generating some um, way by which these people can achieve their full dignity. My point here is that say, well, we have a principle, a couple of principles that can help us in somehow making this principle to happen in real society. One of these principles is principle of subsidiarity. Because if we are waiting for the state or the government to do everything, I think that is not the way to go. I think the spirit of the declaration is precisely a middle ground between the intervention of the state and the individual. Because the, the, the world was uh, uh, somehow rejecting the exaggerated individualism, the individualism of the 30s and, and then the totalitarian system in the, in the 40s. So here is a middle ground, and we have uh, available to us this principle of subsidiarity. In other words, a private citizen can get together and mediate uh, and create certain, let's say, program or projects so that we can help these people who may not, for different reasons of age or disability, help themselves. And there's another principle which precisely we owe the name of the party, the Solidarity Party, which is a virtue, it's a moral virtue somehow doesn't come from the government, come from the individual or the community we try to help them. So my point is that, yes, uh, Social Security may give the minimum in terms of a monetary reward, but at the same time, um, the state must protect the right that we have in order to make associations so that we can mediate and help people in need. So I think that should be, I think, commitment of a party like the Solidarity Party, which is in some ways, or in many ways, is completely different from other political parties which only think power and nothing else. And, and Jim, what, what would you say to uh, John's question as to whether or not this can be construed as a minimalist uh, government form of article, or if this is a big government to the nines? I I'm a little bit of a disadvantage because, though doubtless I wasn't missed, I missed uh, the last five minutes or so of the conversation. I had some uh, internet connectivity oh. issues. I want to, to push things in, in this direction, and I hope it's not, not ignoring critical points. When we talk about personal responsibility, uh, we could think in terms of solidarity brought to the level of each and every one of us and certainly to the level of each and every member of the Solidarity Party. And when we think about personality, uh, personal responsibility, we have to think uh, in terms of 
what we have that we could redirect to people who who lack so much. And I think that in the kind of culture we have, which is very much a culture marked by possessive individualism, we lose sight of that. And if we lose sight of that at the personal level, we certainly lose sight of it at, at the level of our, of our, our states. And to cut through this fog, which I've been generating for the last minute, I want to give a, a story that St. Thomas repeats for us in his discussion of property and the right to property. And it's a story that comes from St. Basil. And Basil is one of the fathers of the church. So, so in his case, think around 300, 300 A.D., so, St. Basil says, the rich, and I might put in, the pretty doggone well-off, the rich who deem as their own property the common goods they have seized upon, are like to those who, by going beforehand to the play, prevent others from coming and appropriate to themselves what is intended for common use. Now, it would be unlawful to prevent others from obtaining possession of common goods. Therefore, it is unlawful to appropriate to oneself what belongs to the community. How much stuff do I have that I don't need, that I'm not using, that other people lack, and that if other people had, they could probably use better than I have? Now, having raised this uh, pointed story told by Basil, uh, St. Thomas says this, A man would not act unlawfully if by going beforehand to the play, he prepared the way for others. But he acts unlawfully if by doing so he hinders others from going. And a like manner, a rich man does not act unlawfully if he anticipates someone in taking possession of something, which at first was common property, and gives others a share. But he sins if he excludes others indiscriminately from using it. And I think the Solidarity Party, in its spirit, certainly draws on this back and forth in its its acceptance of, of what we might call the universal destination of goods. Things are for people. Things are for people. And we we need to always check to see if we're using things wisely. And I, I think the Solidarity Party can contribute enormously, even if we don't have any political uh, uh, weight at this point, and clearly we don't, we can raise this question, is the universal destination of goods uh, something that the people have in mind, or are we simply possessive individualists, and are we developing a country that's interested only in its own power and might? Thanks, Jim. Uh, John, I feel like you were trying to ask a follow-up in there. Well, I was... I was trying not to give like the mentality behind my question because be- prior to social security uh, being uh, the institution that it is now, prior to that, there was a lot of uh, Christian outreach that was going on. So like religious orders that were dedicated to tending of the elderly, tending the poor, things like that. So I, I was kind of po- kind of pointing in the direction that social security, I think, has kind of taken over on that. And even though the mission of, you know, even Christian missions, like they're still there, they're still out there, they still have this uh, focus in mind to tend to the poor. But I think a lot of it has been reduced since the institutional uh, institutionalization of Social Security, and that therefore we've kind of come up with this minimalistic culture of, or mindset rather, of let George do it, you know, let the government do it. This is what we're paying taxes for, let them deal with it. It's no longer our problem. So yeah. that was kind of mentality that I was uh, approaching the question with when right. I uh, originally posted. Can I jump in here? I, th- I have something to uh, on, you know, point out about that. So, so 
you could look at it the other way, where part of the reason why uh, Social Security even came about is because it became clear that the religious orders and, and the religious institutions, for various reasons, uh, you know, may, maybe, you know, partly having to do with the Industrial Revolution, partly having to do with, uh, you know, the, you know, fragmentation, you know, increasing fragmentation of the denominations and the political events going on in Europe and the, the huge size of the U.S., uh, you know, lots of different factors. Uh, they, you know, religious groups felt that they could not adequately take care of people, uh, you know, in that holistic way. And so they actually, you know, especially the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops were among the biggest supporters of uh, Social Security and the New Deal. Uh, and this was far before, uh, you know, some of the Vatican II social teaching of the Catholic Church and uh, some of the more recent documents of the bishops. Uh they, you know, you know, they, they've done some research for this in my dissertation, and it became pretty clear that a lot of this uh, call for government aid did come from religious communities as well. Uh, you know, not all of them, but it, it was pretty widespread, and you know, Catholic, both Catholic and Protestant uh, denominations, as uh, you know, especially like there was a shift, I think, between the say the late eighteen hundreds and the nineteen thirties. So I guess we could look at, you know, why exactly that happened and, you know, how, you know what kind of balance do we need to restore? Thanks, well, who, would have thought, who would have thought that Social Security would become the institution that it is now? I, I, I don't think anyone yeah. was thinking of that back in the day when it was first introduced. They probably thought it was a supplemental thing, never with the never thinking that it would eventually outdo the already existing organizations that were going on. I, I think if we are honest about it and we look into the history, uh, it was precisely because those uh, already existed programs weren't keeping up already that Social Security had to come in to existence. Uh, we, we literally had people, you know, especially the elderly and the disabled, I, I, I don't mean this figuratively. They were literally starving to death. Um, and that's one of the reasons that, um, you know, it, it was particularly sold as a survivor, uh, you know, for, for the elderly, for widows, and uh, for disabled people were the uh, three main groups that were, uh, you know, essentially people wanted them to stop dying due to the neglect of their families and churches. And uh, that's why this bill was able to be passed. And I think the kind of middle ground here would be giving things like grants and tax breaks to nonprofit organizations. But the problem that kind of arises is at what point is an organization to ideologically to the left or right for the government to give them a grant or a tax break? And that's where we kind of I feel like a lot of tension comes. So, Chrissy, just to follow up on that, um, if you're a nonprofit, you're already not uh, being taxed. So when you're saying yeah. a tax break, would that end up being, uh, you know, an, an actual disbursement? Since you would then have a negative tax burden, would you would that be the government actually paying the organization then? I guess it'd be I'm talking about, I guess, people who don't want churches and things like that to have who don't want nonprofits who are religiously affiliated to have um, 501c3. I think it is status. Oh, okay. All right. I think I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so that gets back into uh, what was brought up earlier, this idea of uh, subsidiarity, that just because the government's ensuring that something is done doesn't mean it has to be the government doing it. Yeah. The, and Matthew, um, in uh, it's interesting looking at the development of Christian democracy. Um, a case I think interesting that we may want to consider is the Chilean case in the 1960s, which was very interesting because it was called during the council was the revolution there 
uh, which was not a revolution, was just a democratic government of Eduardo Frey, the disciple of Jacques Maritain in Chile. He called his revolution, his system, a revolution in liberty. One of the policy was precisely social security. So the idea was, yes, the government must intervene in helping those who cannot help themselves, but not completely. So there was a combination between intervention of the government and also the protagonism of civil society. Now, that policy lasted uh, not very long. Um, the reason, one other reason, there may be uh, more than one, one other reason why the social society, the mediated institution, the church, become secularized. So the uh, 1960s were the time of uh, the influence of uh, liberation theology. We trust more in government on the political system rather than the mediated institutions so that um, many uh, priests uh, began forming what was called the movement of third world uh, priests and they began supporting leftist government that led to the socialist uh, election of Allende in 1970. In, in Chile. And the, the whole thing began collapsing. And then, unfor uh, unfortunately, there was another coup d'etat, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the whole point here is to find an equilibrium between our own freedom of association and providing that come from our Christian experience. And then also trust in some ways to the world that man or all is, has, has not been very it's, it's a quite difficult sometimes, this revolution in liberty. And I end with this uh, uh, just <laughs> little story. Uh, in the 1960s, the, Democratic, uh, the Christian Democratic Party in Chile was called Red Fish in Holy Water. Why? Because trying to combine two things seems to be incompatible. On the one hand, the intervention of the government, like Red Fish, like the Marxists. And on the other, Holy Water, say, we are... Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we have in solidarity and build our social community. So ultimately, I think, reside in how well we as a community, whether in a political party or in other places, really live up to our sense of uh, solidarity as Christians. Thank you, Mario. Uh, I think we're down to uh, nine minutes. So I'm going to turn the program back over to Jim at this point and uh, let him uh, ask any questions he wants to about the uh, ongoing work of the Solidarity Party, as well as uh, wrap us up. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Matthew. And thank you very much, Mario, for your uh, red fish and holy water. <laughs> that's, that's really memorable. Uh, let me begin here with Christy since... Uh, we were so happy to have her with us. Could you tell us a bit about your week-by-week -week activities in Maryland? Sure. So last week we had um, we co-hosted a vigil outside of the White House for anti-nuclear um, or for nuclear disarmament, <laughs> and also um, the stopping of drone attacks. So that was pretty powerful. We um, didn't have as big a crowd as I've seen kind of post-Trump. I feel like the year after Trump was elected, we had a big crowd outside of the White House every single week, just passersby, protesters, and now it's died down a little bit. But that gave us a little bit more opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversations, which was great. And then we're going to be co-hosting a... Um, Nuclear Disarmament Conference in at Gaucher College in November. Okay. Very good. Uh, I have brought it to the attention from time to time uh, to members of the Solidarity Party that uh, we have this whole tradition of, of solidarity connecting with the uh, Catholic Worker Movement, which has been an implacable foe of, of militarism and the nuclear arsenal, and delighted to see that Pope Francis, whatever his other difficulties might be, has clearly rejected even the possession of nuclear weapons. So I'm delighted to hear about your work. Skylar, you mentioned uh, uh, the uh, theme of the month last week. 
And here we are uh, looking at the middle of September. How have things been going with uh, the theme for this month and what's in store for next month? Right. So the month of labor is the theme for this month. And uh, so we've had some uh, discussions on our uh, members discussion groups and uh, some you know social media posts uh, you know, discussing labor rights and, uh, you know, building the pro-life, pro-labor movement. Uh, you know, for the last half of the month, we're going to try to get some, uh, you know, submissions by party members for our new blog that we're starting. Uh, October is uh, going to be the uh, month of harvest. And uh, so for that, there's going to be... Uh, you know, more of a focus on uh, rural life and uh, environmental stewardship and agriculture and food security. And I'd like to, uh, you know, create an additional, an additional uh, ASP podcast, uh, not to compete with this one, but just, uh, you know, another venue for uh, people to come on and talk about that, you know, maybe in a... Uh, uh, a shorter time frame, you know, more that that can create, be, cre- you know, creating uh, uh, shorter videos that can uh, bring bring content out to the uh, <laughs> the people with shorter attention spans, uh, because that is unfortunately a uh, political reality. And uh, there'll be a couple of uh, gatherings in October: the uh, Ohio Convention of the Solidarity Party and the uh, Life, Peace, and Justice Conference that we uh, will be uh, co-sponsoring in Pittsburgh. Uh, and then in November, I'm not sure what the theme month for November is going to be, but we're going to have the uh, California State Convention uh, on November 10th, I believe, in, in uh, the Bakersfield or uh, Visalia area. Uh, locate, you know, complete location still to be determined. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we, we would, uh, I'd, I'd be glad to hear any ideas on uh, how we can better implement the uh, month of labor in this last half of the month. Excellent. And for you, Skylar and Christy, uh, Christy mentioned the whole question of keeping things going, sustainability. Yeah. How is it that, that the both of you maintain your, your commitment? Christy, maybe you could get us started. So I've been trying to do at least one thing every day for the Solidarity Party, whether that be an email, a Facebook post, reaching out to a member. And I haven't been as good about it as I wish I was, but that's kind of been my, I don't know, mentality of keeping things going. Just one small thing every day. Good idea. Yeah. Skylar? Yeah. And I should say that, you know, it, we're all very proud of, uh, of your work, Christy, in Maryland and uh, moving that chapter forward. Uh, you know, so my work, uh, having been on a national committee for two years now, it's uh, definitely a lot to to keep track of everything. Uh, so yeah, I also try to uh, focus on one thing every day. Although you know, there, there can be somewhat of a distraction with uh, you know the fact that so much of our work is on social media uh, right now, but. Uh, at least, like, if I see an article that would be interesting uh, for a particular state, I post it to that state's uh, Facebook group. Uh, I, I try to keep in touch with at least one other national committee member each day, uh, you know, whether it be state development or director, outreach director, or a campaigns director. Uh, so, yeah, yeah the uh, you know, just a constant... Uh, Continuing, you know, no matter how slow the progress can admittedly be at times, uh, just you know, continuing to, to keep taking steps toward our, our really important work. La lucha continua. The struggle continues. Sí. And we, we have to recognize that. Uh, we're never going to be done, and we're only going to be uh, just halfway begun. And that's the the human condition. I want to thank all of you, and I want to close with 
today's gospel. This is uh, the feast of the exaltation of the cross, the holy cross. Jesus said to Nicodemus, No one has gone up to heaven except the one who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Thanks to all. Look forward to next week. Godspeed and God bless. Uh, we're officially over, and Sebastian, uh, by the way, that's a file photo of him in the corner of your screen. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, he'll he'll uh, close off the end in proper fashion. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks especially to Christy. Hope you come back next week. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yes, Take care. I, I believe I will not be available next week, but I should be free most other weeks. Well, we're just glad your probation officer gives you the latitude that he does. Uh, yes. <laughs> Tell Teresa we said thanks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. <laughs>